also at this point, we can promise you that the content and the speakers are going to be exceptional. Uh, this morning we have Tim and uh, Chris. Tim is from Plunkett Community, Chris from National Interstate. And they're going to be talking about a number of topics that are relevant to the transportation industry, as well as any organization that has a fleet of vehicles operating on their behalf. Uh, talking about negligent entrustment, the reptile theory, a deposition preparation, and a number of other great topics that are uh, quite timely for the times that we're living in. So with further ado, we would like to introduce our two speakers and we'll turn it over to them. All right. Thank you, Jordan. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Uh, today at Oliver, and, uh, Oliver Van Dyke. I appreciate the opportunity to speak, every, speak to everybody. Just, I want to make sure everything seems to be working. Trust all the, the team here at OVD that we got it going. You can, everybody can hear us and see the presentation. So I'm Chris Michael. I'm with National Interstate. I'm the Vice President of our National Accounts and Truck Alternative Risk Team. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the state of the trucking insurance market, commercial auto insurance market, um, why the, the market is in the state it's in, and really what you can do about it if you're a motor carrier, and how you should see the state of the market as an opportunity. So we're gonna go through, I know Tim and I are gonna just try to go back and forth here. If there are questions, as I understand, uh, you could chat them, and then uh, Jordan will be lobbing those questions to us. So again, appreciate the opportunity to speak with everybody here. So the state of the commercial auto or trucking insurance market. I tried to think of one image that would sum up the state of the market. I really, I'm from Cleveland, Ohio, so I thought about any, really a picture of any Cleveland Browns team from the last 20 years. This quick picture right here to my right on your screen is I think an accurate summary of the commercial auto insurance market. It is a train wreck. If you are paying attention at all, if you read transport topics, freight waves, anything in the news, you would see stories of motor carriers going out of business because insurance prices have risen so dramatically. You'd read about these massive jury verdicts. Yesterday in Florida, there was a verdict for $411 million just yesterday in Florida against a one truck company. State of the market is really getting pretty tough, uh, pretty hard, pretty firm. And prices, especially in excess, in the excess layers of insurance have risen pretty dramatically. So. We'll talk about why in a second. All those headlines I just showed you were pre-COVID. So COVID has further complicated the insurance industry in a number of ways. There's been a, several second and third order consequences of COVID that the industry is really still trying to uh, make sense of. For example, we had a long discussion at dinner last night about what has happened with accident frequency and accident severity since really the world um, slowed down significantly in March. Frequency of loss has dropped. Roads got a lot less congested. The problem is people started to drive like maniacs. And so there was an article just this weekend in the Wall Street Journal about how um, fatalities have risen. They were up 36% nationwide in the month of May. Um, again, people are um, taking advantage or were for a while in the second quarter taking advantage of roads that were empty and then um, getting into some pretty serious wrecks. So as an industry, positive is the frequency seems to drop a little bit, but the severity, i.e. the big crashes, the fatalities were actually rising year over year. Um, right now, again, the insurance industry is trying to figure out as a whole, and I'm talking the bigger property casualty insurance industry, there's ripples all the way across that, that will affect trucking and workers' compensation, especially um, most states, as everybody knows, uh, all the insurance is controlled by the state. Every state has had mandates for insurers to either um, start to, to pay or to um, make sure that uh, you're, they're not collecting premium for a while. And um, it's been very interesting to watch, you know, how coronavirus here is, is starting to go through the system. And it's just going to be uh, great for lawyers for years, I think, <laughs> uh, as, as we'll start to talk about. But COVID, you, you know, there's been lots of questions about how that has affected things. It's not positive, I would say, on net, not positive. Workers' compensation has been a bright spot for those motor carriers out there that you know, have to buy uh, workers' compensation insurance. That line of business has been pretty steady, if not having, if not falling, rates falling in the last uh, several years, a softer insurance market. It seems like 
anything you read right now in the industry would say that COVID is causing in, uh, workers' compensation insurance carriers to check the brakes, and um, we might be at the bottom of the market with workers' compensation. That's what it seems like at this point. Okay. I call this the truck insurance reckoning that we're in. And I promise you there is a silver lining that I will get to. It sounds like there's a lot of bad news right now, but I, I see it as a big opportunity. And, and again, I'll explain why. And, um, you know, hopefully you come away from this saying, this is pretty interesting. And right now, if I do things, uh, cert, you know, if I do certain things, I can separate myself as a motor carrier from my competition who isn't as visionary as me or as safety conscious or, those kind of things. We'll get to that in a second. But I want to imagine, I want you to imagine for a second what it would be like if you had as a motor carrier, and I'm speaking to the motor carriers out there, okay? I want you to imagine if every load that you accepted was contingent upon at some point, you, you could accept the load. Somebody says, hey, you know, here's the, here's, here's the load that you can accept. However, at some point, and it might be a month from now, it might be six months from now, it might be three years or 10 years from now, I'm going to send you a bill for fuel. And that bill might be 100 bucks, it might be 10 grand, it might be a million dollars. Would you accept the load? That is exactly how insurance works. And we are, when we sell our product, when we is the policy, you know, when, we, when we, we agree to accept the risk, we do so contingent on at some point we could pay a loss. And underwriting, trying to price the risk, is equivalent to driving a car by looking in the rearview mirror. When you're trying to look at past history to predict where the future will go, and in some respects it's like rolling the dice in a casino, and that is the tricky part of insurance. Insurance carriers get in trouble when they – take on a bunch of premium, they take on a bunch of risk, and they don't see problems down the road, or they didn't account for, um, you know, future increases in claim severity that, that are going to come and bite them. One of my favorite quotes is by Warren Buffett, which says, only when the tide goes out do you discover who's been swimming naked. And this is a great analogy for what has happened in the truck insurance world in the last four or five years. Lots of insurance carriers got into the market. You know, when, when, when times are good and insurance carriers are making money and there's excess capital out there, people want to get into it. They see, oh, there's premium there. I can, you know, I'll, and then if you don't know what you're doing and you don't know how to analyze the good risk from the bad risk, down the road the claims come through and then you are underwater. And that is what has happened here in the last few years. The reality is the commercial auto insurance world is unhealthy right now. They're losing 10 cents on the dollar. The combined ratio is like operating ratio. So insurance companies, they, they judge themselves on combined ratio. Same thing as operating ratio. Anything over 100 and you're losing money. Anything under 100 and you're making money. Problem is, well, insurance carriers can, can run at 105 combined ratio or 110 combined ratio and actually still make money because of investment income. Again, Warren Buffett, he loves insurance because he's playing the flow, making the investment income on taking the premium and paying the claim later. In today's interest, rates in, in, interest rate environment with rates near zero, um, it is really hard to make the investment return you need and so you need to run under 100 if you want to stay around for any length of time in the trucking insurance business. So on average, trucking insurance carriers in this space are spending a dollar, taking in a dollar and spending a dollar 10. That's what been the last several years. It's predicted to continue for the foreseeable future, even as they have taken rate increases. Okay. I mentioned the analogy of would you accept the load if uh, uh, contingent upon at some point somebody sending you a bill for a million dollars for fuel, just out of the blue, random, even if it was a low probability event, would you accept it? Well, the problem is that's what's happened in the insurance world, that we've had more large claims come through that's called adverse loss development. You anticipated paying X number of claims, and today you're paying X plus 30%. 
And that, that extra 30% wasn't accounted for, and it is crushing a lot of insurance companies that didn't know what they were doing, or didn't choose the right risk. Okay. A couple more slides, and then we'll start to get into some of the, um, you know, what you can do about it and some of the, the, the other things driving it here. But, um, you know, insurance industry is very, very cyclical. It's a lot like trucking. I always talk to motor carriers about how in many ways, if you really understand and analyze the industry, our industry insurance is very similar to trucking. They're very cyclical. Um, people view them as a commodity. In trucking, it's all about capacity and the number of trucks out there. In our world, it's about capital, how much money is willing, or how much, how much will, money is out there willing to get into, um, you know, making these bets, making these, taking, taking this risk, what kind of return you can get on it. And if you look at this chart right here, the return on equity is way down in the industry as combined ratios have gone up. It obviously is inversely proportionate. And so there's really been um, negligible returns for the last few years in the industry. Again, causing the, the remaining insurance carriers to say, we got to do something about this. Here is um, the really frustrating thing. We'll spend time talking about this. Loss severity, rising severity. Okay, we've done a lot of things to try to combat frequency of loss with all the technology that's on the trucks nowadays, the Bendix wingman, the front uh, collision avoidance, all of those things are, are, are good and they're helping to you know, keep frequency in check, frequency per 100 million miles, per million miles. The problem is the average claim is costing a lot more. In 2012, just eight years ago, the average jury verdict against, in, in, a, in a claim involving a, a trucking company was 2.6 million. And you probably, a number of you, if you have seen any of the um, ATRI studies or read any of these articles in freight waves, in just, just seven years later, the average jury verdict was up five and a half fold. 17 and a half million. It's crazy. So if you're an insurance carrier five years ago and you're trying to price the risk and you're trying to guess as to where the claims are going, you do not see this coming. And that's the rub right now. Okay. Here's the bad guy. <laughs> Truly. Some people are aware of this. I would say um, a minority of the motor carriers I talk to are aware of this um, then you need to know about it. There is a growing industry, a, a, a large and growing industry uh, of litigation funding. Plaintiff's attorneys that are being funded by hedge funds and private equity money to try and milk marginal claims involving a trucking company and hit the jackpot. So again, Tim and I, uh, Tim, doing the noble job of defending the motor carriers. Um, we'll talk about some of this, but it's very frustrating now that there's billions of dollars going into funding some plaintiff's attorneys that all they're doing now is trying to look at a bunch of claims and say, which one is, is the claim that I can hit pay dirt on? And they're running a, um, a playbook that, um, called Reptile Theory. That I'll hit in just a second. There's an attitude now, and, and, I, and I'm sure that there's going to be some head, heads nodding out there that in America um, that uh, we call social inflation, which is the mentality that, you know what, they've got deep pockets, that insurance carrier has deep pockets, that motor carrier has insurance limits. Um, we deserve it. We, you, know, you know, that seems to be the prevailing mentality and um, what these plaintiff's attorneys are doing very skillfully to, to make these marginal claims um, that a couple years ago maybe would have had a defense verdict um, to, to suddenly be worth millions of dollars. And, and that is really interesting. I, I just uh, I practice here in Grand Rapids. I have about 27 years. Um, I'm with Plunkett Cooney. We're right here in West Michigan. Um, but you simply drive between Chicago and Detroit and the billboards are unbelievable with, with the plaintiff's personal injury attorneys in terms of what's going on. It, it's very clear out there, the message is uh, anti-motorcycle drivers and anti-truck drivers. And you 
see those signs everywhere in the Midwest. I, I'm often between Detroit, where our main office is, with Plunkett Cooney in Chicago. We have an office there, too. Luckily, I, I practice here uh, on the civil defense side, a lot of transportation litigation in West Michigan, where it's certainly far more conservative. But a real trend that I've seen, for example, any of you in West Michigan, the plaintiff's personal injury attorneys in Detroit have all opened up offices the last five to seven years in Grand Rapids. They've come to Grand Rapids because of the growth in the area in terms of population, and, and there's more money here, quite frankly. I'm sure that's happening in other areas as well, but it, it, it's certainly evident that the, the general public out there, the, the years I've been litigating, it, it's not favorable to be operating a motorcycle, operating a truck, and that, that becomes very, very difficult um, I had not seen numbers with that huge of a change, but it doesn't surprise me in terms of average verdict. Um, typically, what I experience here in, in West Michigan, my practice is so much of this stuff. Ultimately, you're not going before a jury. You're going before a mediator and trying to resolve if you can, because you can get easily the runaway jury situation that makes it very, very difficult to, uh, to defend. The other issue in Michigan, too, is, as folks know, is we're a no-fault state, which is a whole other animal in terms of dealing with um, with the situation. So that, that uh, is present as well. But unlike you know, a Texas or California, Florida, New Jersey, um, fortunately in West Michigan where I practice, I've practiced my whole career, it, it's certainly more favorable to defense the conservative juries, but it, it's so jurisdiction specific. It and like you and I talked yesterday, so Tim and I were talking about how in Western Michigan here, um, it's certainly um, more conservative, more favorable venue. Um, if you are involved in, a, in an accident that ends up getting litigated than it is on the eastern half of the state. Right. The problem is the, the, the eastern half of the state is going to move this way. Right. That, that The world is, we call them jurisdictional hell holes. <laughs> and we do, national interstate, we do business in every state. Uh, let me tell you, you don't want to run a motor carrier in California, in Louisiana, Jersey, um, yeah, Jersey Illinois. It is tough. There are um, parts of the world that are that are very, very against the motor carrier, where, where uh, the deck is stacked against you. Um, and so, yeah, for now, it's you know, it might be okay in Western Michigan. You got to be aware of that stuff and preparing it, for it. Right? It's changed dramatically yeah. in the 20 years I've been here. It's certainly become very, very uh, more plain oriented. There was a case in Kalamazoo a few years back, about seven or eight years ago, where the key issue was conscious pain and suffering. And I think the decedent at somewhere in the neighborhood of one to three hours of conscious pain and suffering. The, the case was tried. Uh, I think liability was disputed. Uh, I was not personally involved with the case, but I know the jury returned a very, very large, somewhere in the neighborhood of 12 to $15 million verdict based upon the plaintiff's attorney, frankly, doing a pretty good job with the issue of taking each minute of conscious pain and suffering, putting a number, a dollar figure on that, and then multiplying it for the total amount of the uh, conscious pain and suffering. So. That component of conscious pain and suffering, at least in Michigan, is compensable. And what, what plaintiff's attorneys will do is they'll put a, a figure on it. I, I want $100,000 per minute. I want $75,000 per minute. Well, that adds up pretty quickly. Um, and it, it becomes a, a, the cases I've had that have gotten very, very high, that element of conscious pain and suffering has been a significant um, part of, the, uh, of the, the jury verdict or the, or the settlement discussions. So we'll talk about reptile theory now. So reptile theory, I'm guessing that um, some of you out there are, have heard of it or aware of it. If you're not, you need to Google it today. Google reptile theory. And this is from two enterprising plaintiff attorneys in 2009 that wrote a white paper about how to make a very marginal claim and turn it, take that claim and, and make it into something very big. And they call it the reptile theory because it really is, is about trying to play on the part of the human brain that is the oldest, the reptilian part that is fight or flight, to try to make the other party feel like a menace, um, to threatening, scary, and, and, and really out to harm you. And so that, that's what the, the plaintiff's attorneys are doing, uh, is, is running this reptile theory playbook, and you need to know how to combat it. And it's about preparing correctly in a deposition. It's about, and we can talk about that in a second. I'd be curious to get your thoughts on it, Tim. 
Um, it's about making sure you have your house in order so that you do not open yourself up to the potential large uh, verdict. Making sure you don't have a marginal hire, that you um, aren't cutting corners, that you're doing what your, your um, safety manuals, manuals say you're going to do, that, that things match, um, you know, that you're actually doing what you should be doing. Um, so reptile theory is, 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 the way I liken it is, Every morning, every Monday morning, in their giant wood paneled conference room, the plaintiff attorney that you see on the billboard gets together um, with, with um, his staff and he says, okay, what, what you know, claims do we have this weekend? And they go around the room and they say, you know, such and such, here's this claim, here's this claim. It is not about the facts of law. It is not about the facts. It is about how can we make that motor carrier look bad. It doesn't matter if they're not at fault. In, in the, the classic example is the Warner trucking verdict from a few years ago. And, and, and I'm guessing that some of you out there are very aware. And, but that is the, the, the claim where the Warner truck was doing nothing wrong. Going down the highway in Texas, um, it was some icy rain. He was under the speed limit for the conditions. The logs are good. The truck is good. There's no issues with lights or continuity tape, anything like that. Everything's good. Pickup truck loses control, comes across the median, right into the, the Werner truck. Fatality, uh, serious injuries, horrible, horrible claim. Awful. That Werner truck did nothing wrong. There was zero culpability. And as we all know, or as many know, Werner got hit with an $89 million verdict. Why? Because it had nothing to do with the facts. The facts said that the woman who had lost control of the pickup was at fault. However, the skilled plaintiff attorney was able to say that Werner cared more about the almighty dollar. They cared more about moving freight than they did about the motor in public. And they were able to demonstrate that Werner had cut corners with their hiring guidelines and, you know, certain things in the deposition, the way they, the way they take the safety manager down a path in the deposition to say, you know, shouldn't the driver be more aware of the conditions? Shouldn't that driver, doesn't that driver have a duty to, you know, you need a CDL. Um, isn't that uh, uh, require a, uh, you know, shouldn't, shouldn't that require a higher duty of care? Yes. You know, they, they take them down a path and suddenly, the jury says, man, you know, Werner, that, hey, they shouldn't even be on the road. That woman would be alive if, they, if that trucking company didn't care so much. They, they, that truck shouldn't have been on the road. Their fault. $89 million. That is reptile theory. And that's what you have to prepare for. And, and, and it does, Chris, it really takes place in the depositions with, with a skilled claim strength. The, the areas I see it most is in a trucking case. Uh, also happens a lot of the medical malpractice arenas where you'll see it take place. I've got a lot of partners uh, throughout the state that handle med mal cases, and that's typically what they're doing. What, what the plaintiff's trainers will do with it is really try to make the jurors think in their mind that they're the ultimate protector enforcer of perfect safety. That basically if anything goes wrong, you, Mr. or Mrs. Juror, have to take care of that, remedy it, correct it, and uh, they'll do it, as, as Chris said, with, with a safety director and start with that and with that deposition and then with the driver in terms of looking, trying to put in their mind, and, and really what it gets to is changing the, the, the duty perspective. You know, the duty of any driver out there in a passenger vehicle, motor vehicle, is to be reasonable, reasonable for the conditions, but it's not perfect safety. People know driving out there, things happen. People go beyond the speed limit. People are inattentive at times. Things take place. There's other motoring uh, vehicles out there that, that, that take place and have issues. And so nothing's perfect, but that's how the line of question will be, basically to the point where, you know, Mr. Safety Director, isn't it your job to ensure that package uh, gets from destination from point A to point B completely safe without any issues? Isn't it your job to ensure that all of your drivers are completely perfect in obeying every rule of the road and do nothing wrong. Isn't it your job to ensure that there's absolutely no 
accents out there, and they'll try to change basically the standard of care, that duty element with respect to a, a no fault or with an automobile uh, trucking matter, and, and, and heighten that duty. And that's where, frankly, a, a good defense attorney on behalf of the trucking company has to prep that safety person, has to prep the driver, stay within your lane, basically. Talk about the duty is a reasonable, in Michigan, it's a reasonable standard of care. It's not a heightened standard of care. In, in medical malpractice, it frankly works even better because you can imagine deposing a surgeon or a doctor, the plan string using the reptile theory is going to say that every surgery has to be successful. And every surgery has to be safe. Well, that, that's nonsense. That's not the standard of care uh, with respect to a doctor. It's what's reasonable for that specifically, an orthopedic physician, a cardiologist, whatever, Surgery in itself is not completely safe. Driving a semi-tractor trailer on the highway is not completely safe. There are inherent risks with respect to other motorists, with respect to the weather, with respect to equipment, any number of things. But you, you go down that road with a skilled plan steering that gets the safety person, the driver starting to acknowledge and accept and, and agree to it, it really presents a problem because then, as, as Chris said, the jury is sitting out there and the theory becomes you, Mr. and Mrs. Juror, have to make this a completely safe, foolproof operation. And if anything went wrong, they've got to be the bad guy and they've got to pay for it. Um, so it, it, in prepping drivers and safety folks for, for depositions, it, it takes a lot of time. It certainly is done well in advance of the, of the uh, deposition and it, it's giving a lot of hypothetical and making it clear to them what exactly the, the duty is, it's being reasonable for the circumstances and nothing more and nothing less, and get ready for these types of questions that kind of lead you down the primrose path. What, what I always tell drivers that I'm, I'm defending is, is be prepared to be kind of boxed in. The plaintiff's attorney's job is basically to box you in with respect to specifically speed, distance, measurement, timing, so if they can then take that testimony and take it to their accident reconstruction expert, their constituity expert, whoever, and have something to work with. And I, and I tell my clients all the time, an answer of I don't know or I don't recall is, is completely acceptable. If you don't know if it's five car lengths or 10 car lengths, or you don't know the distance between the time you first applied the brakes to the time of the impact, you simply make it clear, I don't know. If you can give an answer and it's honest and truthful and you can give an estimate, you do that. But too many times people are left feeling as though they're compelled um, and they're intimidated by the process. They have to give a response. If they don't know, you simply say, I don't know. But the, the goal of the plan stream, simply the depositions, is to get boxed in the driver, the safety person, so they can then take that information to their accident recon expert and help to basically develop a theory of plan in terms of what took place. Um, a lot of that's eliminated with, with ECM, with some of the different downloads and things that you can really you know, pinpoint um, pr precisely what took place. I mean, I'll get all different types of statements from, from a plaintiff who's injured, from a driver, when you've got the download in a passenger vehicle and a semi-tractor trailer telling you exactly what took place five seconds before the impact, that, that takes away a lot of the gray area. So many times people feel compelled to start getting estimates in terms of distance and timing and sequencing, and it just really becomes problematic because then you're, you're locked into that, that testimony. I'll have you know, five or six witnesses observe a motor vehicle accident, and every one of them has a different version as to the type of vehicle, the color of the vehicle, what the color of the light was, how far the car was away from the light from the intersection. It, it becomes very, very difficult, very fact-specific. Yeah, I think that um, a good defense attorney is going to help you see that a lot of times the answer is it depends, you know, and, and you, you mentioned safety and there's such an interesting misperception of what safety is. Here is how you define safety. Safety is the absence of risk. That's it. If you want to be safe and if your mantra is, safety is job one, you're fooling yourself, okay? When, when I hear people say safety is job one, I kind of say, okay, I understand the, the, the sentiment, but it's not true. Because if safety was job one, you would park your trucks. 
the only way for you to be 100% safe that something might not go wrong is to not move a truck. You'd keep them on the lot. Trucking is inherently a dangerous activity. There's no way around it. And like Tim said, there is a, there is a you know, reasonable assumption of, of, of risk out there. And if you're trying to do everything you can to mitigate risk and to, um, to follow the law, it, and that, that is great. But sometimes things go wrong. We have to accept risk. And the trick then is to how do you mitigate it? How do you manage it? And then if something happens, what do you do about it so that, you know, you can contain it, you can uh, protect your reputation, the assets of your company, all of those things, okay? So just a couple other things, and then, and then we'll get into uh, what you do about it here. What else is driving these rates higher? Of course, okay, roads are congested, they're in disrepair, we need an infrastructure bill, our drivers are getting older. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's a tough job and the driving force is getting older. It's, it's hard to find good younger drivers. It's a tough job. And guess what? Everybody's staring at their stupid phone the whole time. I drove up here from Cleveland and half the people we drive by are staring at their phone. It's ridiculous. So it's very dangerous. And in, in litigation, everyone, I think it's obvious. One of the first things that takes place, both defense attorneys, plaintiff attorneys, are going to subpoena the cell phone records and get those all the time. And, and you'll have completely inconsistent stories in terms of when they last sent the send for the text or when they took the phone call, but invariably those are always subpoenaed. They always come out and um, it usually is not good news typically because as Chris said, I, I find it, 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 you just look around, people are constantly and consistently using their phones, um, be it a call, a text, navigation, whatever. But those, if anyone thinks that their drivers um, and me as a defense are not going to subpoena and get cell phone records. Um, it, it happens almost every time you're dealing with a litigated case involving more vehicle crashes because it's so key and so pertinent. Um, I, I had one recently that just got resolved through mediation where the, uh, the driver had just hung up on a call to his wife about 30 seconds before the impact um, and, and Kimberly had missed that the traffic was slowing ahead on I-96 between Lansing and Grand Rapids with respect to construction ahead. That was a big problem for my case um, because uh, he, he frankly, the testimony was, it was several minutes, 10 to 15 minutes before that the phone call ended, but the phone call literally ended seconds before uh, the, the collision. So that was a problem for me with respect to that issue, but they're, they're always gonna be subpoenaed. They're gonna come in and, um, we, we deal with that all the time. Okay, so if you're a trucking insurance carrier, okay, if you're if you're insure if you, you if you're in the business of insuring trucks and commercial auto fleets, you have three options right now. You, first of all, okay, you can't predict where the severity is going. The, the trend is not good. So you sit here and go, what can we do about this? Well, you can leave the market. And there's been plenty of insurance carriers that have left the market in the last few years. Um, probably four or five years ago now, um, AIG's Lexington unit was the 800 pound gorilla in the excess space. They said, you know what? We don't know what the heck is going on. We're just gonna take our ball and go home. And then others followed in the primary space, Zurich, et cetera. There's been a number of insurance carriers that just said, we're out. We're not gonna do this anymore. You could raise your rates. You can just say, you know what? Doesn't matter. Everyone's getting a twenty percent rate increase. We're just—it's that's how we're going to deal with this, um, and we're going to see what sticks. Some people have been doing that, or you can be more selective. And the the, the trick in underwriting, again, when you're trying to predict the future, and is is to really try to analyze which risk is better than another one. And, and that, that, that's really about identifying the motor carriers that are doing it right, right? This is the good news. You know, I feel like up to this point, it's like, okay, other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, how was the theater? But this is a significant opportunity. I view it this way, all right? The insurance 
market is hard. Rates have gone up. Why, though, if you're a motor carrier, would you want if – you, if you're a motor carrier and you're trying to do it right, you're trying to follow the rules, you're trying to have a, a, a culture that, um, you know, celebrates – your drivers doing things the right way, incentivizing your drivers doing the right way. You're trying to hire and train and recruit and manage a business the right way. You're, if you're doing that, why would you want the guy down the street who doesn't do it the right way, who cuts corners, who's a cowboy, why would you want that motor carrier to be able to buy cheap insurance? You should get what you deserve. And that's really what we're seeing now is the shakeout in, in insurance carriers that are getting a lot more selective in, in really trying to figure out which motor carriers um, are doing things the right way. Okay, along with that, here's, here's the good news too. If you are doing it right, there will be a competitive market for your risk. There always will be, okay? We are a for-profit business, for-profit industry. And there's a lot of smart people. There's a lot of dumb people <laughs> in the insurance world that maybe don't know what they're doing, but there's plenty of really smart people too. And there will be a market for well-run motor carriers, okay? Technology, and man, we could talk about cameras for the next five hours. We won't. I get very worked up and passionate about cameras. Two-way, inward-facing, outward I, I love the camera technology. It's a game changer. It's pretty cool. Uh, but it, you, you get very passionate people on one side or the other point is technology is going to really start to make a big impact here. Not only with, you know, the, the, the stuff I mentioned earlier, the, the, the rear end avoidance and lane changing and all of that, and eventually autonomous, and I mean, that stuff will absolutely be a game changer. The people who are being proactive and figuring out which technologies to invest in, how to manage them, there's, there's a lot to evaluate. But if you're, if you're doing it the right way and using the right um, tools there, it's going gonna, it's gonna to make an impact and separate you. On, on that note, I mean, I, I never have seen this, but it's now commonplace. Accident reconstruction experts, sheriff departments, police are all using drones now. Hmm. It, it, drones with accident reconstruction have been taking place all the time that I didn't see in, in the years past. So we'll, we'll typically subpoena, get the accident reconstruction file, just have one recently where all of the footage, the aerial stuff, is via a drone uh, that the police department is using with respect to their initial investigation. And then when we, on the defense side of the claim strength, hire an accident recon person, they're using drones to get the aerial view of things, um, either the day of the crash, if it's a fatality, I've got one now that that just was, was employed, or thereafter to kind of get the set of the, the, the scene, direction, location, uh, obstructions, everything. So the drone technology is unbelievable. It's used all the time now. Yeah. And, um, and the cameras are getting so much better, so much faster. If you look at what they're doing now with um, Samstar, SmartDrive, Naturdyne, Lytics, the, the, the artificial intelligence that's now being built in to the cameras is really cool. We had a um, client of ours that two weeks ago sent, sent us a video that blew my mind. They have one of the latest cameras with artificial intelligence technology that is looking inside the cab and monitoring the driver's eyes. So we can tell if the driver takes his or her eyes off the road for any extended period of time. Our driver is going down the highway at midnight. Weather's clear, traffic, no, there's no traffic. He's doing the speed limit. Everything is great. Camera sees the guy doing the speed limit, and he reaches down and pulls up a book, a, literally a book, and starts to read a book while he's driving 65 miles an hour with a fully loaded trailer behind him. And within five seconds or whatever, the chime went off and said, hey, you know, you, you, your eyes are off the road. Now, normally it'd be the guy dozing off, right, or, or, or looked at his cell phone or whatever. This guy decided that he was going to read um, Moby Dick or whatever that he was reading. And, of course, it uploaded the video. We saw it. And then you can 
you can change that behavior with that driver or get rid of the driver before that driver kills someone. Last thing here, and this is where we're going to spend some time. You can do all these things. You can invest in the right technology, um, really care about culture, you're, you're, you know, you're managing, coaching your drivers, that kind of thing. But if you're using the wrong risk financing tool, then you are just a buyer in the, in the market. You're a, you're, you're um, commodity. a commodity. You're getting whatever the market will, deal, will give you. And um, you've got to be smarter about how you finance the risk. Here's what I think is the really big opportunity for a motor carrier right now and how you need to view this. That it's a simple equation. If you're proactive on managing and mitigating risk, and then you use the right risk financing tools and partnerships and, and lean on the right experts, people like Tim Sheridan's firm and, and, and Jordan and the team at OVD, that that will give you a cost of risk advantage or cost of risk leverage. Another simple analogy would be, it's like if you're an over the road fleet and you try to do everything you can to maximize miles per gallon. Okay, you can't control the, the price of diesel, but you can do some things to take advantage of when the price of diesel rises. You can trick out your trucks with all the latest, greatest, you can try to incentivize your drivers to drive really gently. And if you then can average a higher MPG than your, your, your other, you know, over the road competitor, you want the price of diesel to rise. That is the same analogy here. It's very similar. And so that's where I think you, you know, you got to have that, that same mentality that the rest of the world is starting to deal with this poorly run motor carriers, are not able to buy cheap insurance now. So now you have to be savvy and take advantage of you doing the right thing. Okay, I'll expand on this a little bit. Proactive risk management, what that means to me. And, and, and again, I'm giving the 30,000 foot overview here in, in an hour, hour and a half. This is something that you need to have in depth conversations with your agent, with your insurance carrier, and really try to, to dig deeper on some of this. Proactive risk management, what does that mean? To me, it means, number one, getting your house in order, no exceptions. The biggest problem that we see, or I would say the biggest ticking time bomb that, that um, is out there are the motor carriers that say, we're gonna keep this driver. Man, we just need to fill the seat. He's a great driver, he's a great guy. He made a mistake, I know he doesn't, fit our guidelines, or I know we had a DUI a couple years ago, but man, we need to fill the trucks. That is the nuclear verdict. That's where, even when you're not at fault, facts don't matter. That's when the skilled plaintiff attorney using reptile theory says, well, you've made exceptions in the past. You clearly don't care about the motoring public. You need to, you, you, yeah, you, you, you are, um, opening yourself up to the big verdicts when you don't have your house in order and you make those, those um, exceptions. Safety culture. I've met with, I don't know, hundreds of trucking company executives over the years. I can tell the owners and CEOs and presidents who care and are aligned with their safety department and those that are not. It can, you can tell right away. If, if safety is neutered and they're not on the same page with dispatch and, and they are at odds with each other and, and safety is an afterthought or something we just got to do because, you know, you got to check the box, safety needs to come from the top down. When ownership is invested and they support their drivers in, in, in the right way, you know, giving good feedback, coaching, and they truly care, that is a good thing, but you can tell when, when there's a disconnect there. And, and juries, Chris, you, I mean, juries know that too. If you do have to try the case, when you have ownership, a safety director, and the driver all saying the same thing and being genuine and sincere with it, you, you can tell, but most importantly, juries can tell. They can tell when that is 
the forefront of that particular carrier versus others that just, it's an afterthought, it's just going through the routine. Again, that, that comes down to it. We don't try a ton of trucking stuff because, frankly, they're, they're difficult cases. But when you do, if you have from the top down that type of level of commitment, sincerity, it, it, it comes across. The, jur the juries see through it. When you've got a 12-person jury, as we do in Michigan and trying cases, they see through it and they know what they're dealing with. And it, it counts. It counts a lot, particularly when sometimes accidents just simply happen nothing egregious that takes place, you want to be defending a carrier and, a, and an organization that has that level of commitment and it comes across and you, you can't fake it. You just can't. I met with, a couple of weeks ago, I met with a pretty large motor carrier, several hundred units, and it was um, just, it amazed me. I sat down with their CFO and three of the folks on the safety team. And the CFO, we were talking about, you know, the, the, the predicament they faced with rising insurance costs and how they were facing a significant increase at their renewal. We didn't insure them, but they were getting a, we were, we were you know, looking, kicking the tires on, on, um, on their risk. And sitting there with the CFO, um, he told me, as we talked about, you know, trying to, to do things the right way and, and make investments. And, and, and he, he was up front that, you know, the owner who wasn't there, just, it, he just wasn't ever going to do cameras. He wasn't, you know what, this stuff, that was a bunch of stuff, I don't know, it's too expensive. It's, it's no. And, and, and on and on. I mean, there was, there was plenty more examples. And the safety people, you could tell, I mean, and they, they opened up, a little bit later after after the CFO left, they said, yeah, I mean, you know, they don't they don't listen to it. Dispatch doesn't listen to it. It's just, and I was like, man, this this is a big motor carrier that is going to get crushed someday. They they are a ticking time bomb, and that's that's they're out there. Um, that last bullet right there, um, you know, there's a lot you can do to manage and mitigate claims once they occur having good counsel, having good relationships with your insurance carrier, your broker. Obviously, you want to be on top of these, and like we talked about earlier, making sure that your drivers are um, prepped for any kind of deposition, your safety personnel, anybody um, that's going to be interviewed, that stuff matters a lot. It is very frustrating. Uh, I'm sure that there's plenty of people out there that, that have – you know, claims that are there have kept them up at night um, because you, know, you didn't do anything wrong and you might end up settling for a few hundred thousand dollars or something like that. And it is a tricky thing to manage a claim when you're sitting there going, well, there's a 20% chance that this, this verdict could come back for a million bucks, a couple million bucks. Should we take that? Should we, should we risk it, you know, or should we try to settle this thing for 150 grand now? Those are the conversations you need to have and, and, and face those tough decisions, but you need to be on top of that stuff. Having to, you know, really well-documented files with the drivers, you know, we typically, I'll routinely have, uh, hopefully the carrier has a personnel file for the driver and a driver qualification file. Two separate files that are kept, they're well-maintained, documented, documented, so that, because all that stuff is going to be asked for and written and that paper trail from the moment they interview to the screening process, their prior employers, all that stuff comes into play and can really set a nice story if it's positive and well-documented in terms of the steps, the reasonable steps that the motor carrier took in terms of recruitment, retention, hiring drivers, and their, and their, their path, um, which really helps out with respect to documented accidents. All that stuff it is certainly discoverable and asked whether or not it ever comes in. If you try the case, that's something we fight about with motions and eliminate. But having a well-documented personnel file and driver qualification file makes our job that much easier and presents, kind of as Chris said, a very well-tuned uh, motor carrier from the safety people to the executives to the drivers on the same page versus having absolutely nothing. We don't have, we don't keep personnel file. We don't have a driver 
driver qualification file, we just kind of wing it. Less paper and less documentation really makes it difficult. In, in Michigan, the statute of limitations is three years. So you're, you're talking many times, we're not seeing on the litigation side, um, suit filed until, you know, we're usually many times, it's usually a year and a half after two, two and a half years after, but up to three years. So having all of the ducks in a row with those two components of the driver's file is helpful. Same thing too, once the accident happens, I mean, as much documentation as possible. Drivers I work with that literally have cameras and document the scene is huge. It's tremendous and helpful. Um, the one I talked about before, a crash I had on I-96, skid marks were actually taken photographs by the driver because there was clearly an earlier accident in the same area that had nothing to do with the accident that I was then defending. And that driver took photos of those skid marks to demonstrate this, these were already here. These were pre-existing. You can never have enough of that type of documentation, be it with incident report, with photographs, you name it, right, right then to preserve that stuff. Because with a three-year statute of limitations, by the time that lawsuit, that claim hits our desk, all this stuff is gone. Um, so uh, photograph, document, write down, get names. Many times witnesses arrive on a scene. I've got a case right now where a witness arrived on the scene and very supportive to my driver. He took the name down, took her number, and I'm able to follow up. That person was not listed in the UD-10, the police report, but the driver had the foresight to, to get that, that identification and uh, was, was very, very helpful. But the photographs are incredible. But to now to have photographs right after a damage, et cetera, the scene is huge. Um, so when I have that, it makes my job a lot easier. So step one is that having your house in order, trying to mitigate and manage risk. And the second part of the equation here is how can you intelligently finance the risk? I would try to implore you, and, and this is, it drives me nuts because the insurance industry is its own worst enemy. We turn on the TV and we, we see every 30 seconds, 15 minutes can save you 15% or more. <laughs> Insurance is highly commoditized. We are taught to shop, to view it as an annual purchase, as something that you have to do and just, it's an app, you know, it, it, you buy it and then you, you forget about it. It's aggravating. It's not a fun process. I work in insurance and I hate paying for my own insurance because it's, it's frustrating. I get it, but it's certainly nice to have. And, and um, the, the point is, you got to get out of this mentality of just buying a, a, on the, ham, the annual hamster wheel. You need to think about how do I really finance and manage that cost of risk. Cost of risk is very different from insurance. The motor carriers that get it think about cost of risk and how do I really stabilize it, reduce it over time so that I can make my cost of risk more predictable and hopefully less than my competition, okay? And there's ways to do that here. And what I mean is, number one, do the math, okay? This is where, um, you know, if you're a motor carrier and you have 50 units, 100 units, 200 units, it's not a question of if you're going to have a claim, it is when. It's a mathematical certainty. The law of large numbers that you learn about in high school statistics is it, it, what, all of our underwriting models are predicated upon. So when you start to really analyze the, the math and the risk and look at, okay, what can we reasonably assume will be our claims going forward? How many claims are gonna be little claims? Most claims are little claims. There's a bell curve, right? Most of them are little. They're, you knock over the, the, the mailbox or the, you, you know, have a little fender bender. Most of them are that way. Those are the claims that you can more often control. You know, through who you hire, how you train, what kind of technology you have, you can try to control the little ones. You can control the little ones, hopefully you control the big ones. Frequency, breed, severity. Every once in a while, though, you have the big claim. And so you got to start to understand the math, how much risk is predictable, how much you should retain, retain that risk via a deductible, a captive arrangement, 
some sort of hybrid or retro type program, there are insurance options that will allow you to retain the predictable layer of risk, the layer of risk that you can control. And if you do that, then you will benefit and not the insurance carrier. The goal is to try to assume the re a reasonable amount of risk so that you make the underwriting profit in investment income and not the insurance carrier. And then you, you seed away or you transfer away the high limit unpredictable risk. And it, it's, it's about, you know, I, I always, I think it's funny, um, again, 15 minutes will save you 15% or more. Our industry is conditioned to, and I, I will bet there's plenty of people out there who get a call every day or every week from an insurance broker that knows nothing about your operation and says, I bet I can save you money on insurance. <laughs> I don't know how they would know that exactly, but it's, it's a very price-driven type of sale often. I think about it this way, though. You know, I don't know why you would want to use the cheapest attorney or the cheapest CPA. You want an attorney who is really good, who is going to tell you where the pitfalls are, where, you, you know, the different, different strategies and ideas that you might not have thought about as an expert. Same goes with a very good insurance broker. There are great insurance brokers out there that are going to help explain and educate the different ways you can finance the risk, the pros and cons, instead of just saying, here's five options, let's choose the cheapest. The price is what you pay and value is what you get in everything in life, right? So you need to find good partners who understand what they're doing, get their advice, try to educate yourself, and look at the options, especially now. You know, what options are there so that I can retain a reasonable amount of risk and I can start to better control my costs down the road? So the guy who is just a price taker, i.e. just buying insurance year to year, that cyclical insurance cycle, that person is going to end up ultimately paying more because the difference is, Somebody is paying $5 a mile or $10 per 100 miles in the regular insurance market when a guaranteed cost type of program. And then there's somebody else who might be in a deductible or captive type arrangement. And maybe they pay the same price, but over time they're, they're, they're seeing money come back because they were in a captive and they got a dividend or underwriting profit back. And their net cost of risk isn't five, it's four. That's, that's the idea. So I'm going to close with a thought on where the industry is going, and then Tim's going to talk about negligent entrustment, and then we can do Q&A and any other questions or, or whatever. So um, who is this right here in this slide? Billy Bean. I love the movie Moneyball. <laughs> it's a great book. Great. It's a movie that's almost as good as a book, actually, but... Um, Billy Bean obviously revolutionized, well, maybe not Billy Bean, it was um, Sabermetrics, right? But um, Billy, Me Billy Bean really was the first one to take the idea of, you know, analyzing data and statistics and, and really rethinking baseball and all the sacred cows that have been held for decades in baseball and, and totally rethinking them. We are in the same, we're, I guess to, to strain the analogy further, we're, we're in the early innings of moneyballing the insurance industry. There is an unbelievable amount of data being spit off the trucks through all the telematics devices. My company, National Interstate, has a huge initiative to capture all the data as much as we can. And the idea is capture it and then weaponize it. Weaponize it meaning we start to then, we start to pair up all the data on acceleration and, and heartbreaking and, and, and weather patterns traffic patterns, time of day, driver profile, claims patterns, all of that stuff so that we can moneyball where the claims are going to be. Rather than looking through the rear, rear view mirror and trying to predict going forward, we're saying there's the red warning flag that is flat or the, the warning lights flashing right here because this, we know that this is the highest risk behavior, inter, whatever. And so that, that is where the industry is going um, in there will be those that get left behind and those that figure it out. And so um, it's going to be very interesting to see what happens here in the next decade as we start to really harness a lot of the data that is now being captured. 
And, and you will want to be with an insurance carrier that helps you get insight into what the data is saying. You know, gives you benchmarks. It helps you be able to better price where the risk really is in the different lanes that you travel. You may find out so that when you're evaluating a new lane or a new shipper, that man, that, that one comes with, that lane right there has got a 20% higher um, cost of risk. I need to bake that into my, my, my model. I need to charge for it. Or this one, oh man, it, I know that, that lane over there, that whatever, that, that is, that, that's a better cost of risk. I can be more aggressive in my pricing and outsmart the motor carrier who doesn't understand that. Like anything, this, this insurance market is making the strong get stronger and the weak get weaker. The strong in the insurance carrier space are getting stronger, the weak are getting weaker. So it applies to both insurance carriers and motor carriers. Um, and, and again, I, I feel like I can't stress enough trying to find good partnerships um, and, and really lean on, uh, you know, those partners to help you make good decisions. And, um, you know, I, for those of you that are, that, that are, that, that do that, do that now that are using cameras that are, you know, I, I applaud the efforts. It is a hard job. It is a difficult thing to run a motor carrier well, for sure. <laughs> It is not easy. So this stuff is easy for me to say that the insurance market is hard and it's an opportunity, but I get it. But, um, you know, the stronger you're going to get stronger, the weaker you're going to get weaker. So, okay. Um, the thought was give a little idea, a little bit about negligent entrustment and what that is. Um, can you hit the button that yep. puts up there as a definition? It, yep. is, um, it, it is certainly a viable claim in Michigan. Just a little bit of backdrop drop here in terms of how Michigan works. I, if I'm boring some folks that are not in Michigan, but Michigan's a no-fault state, so we deal in that, uh, that realm that has been since like 1972. We had a big change in Michigan this past summer in, in terms of uh, trying to control the first party stuff. Um, in, in a long story short, kind of a summary, in, in Michigan, there's a no, there's no-fault statute been in place. You have a first party claim and you have a third party claim. Typically, with the, with the trucking work that I do, I'm defending third-party claims, which is plaintiff against the trucking company as the owner of the semi-tractor trailer and the driver. Invariably, the, the owner of the trucking firm and the driver are both named a lawsuit, and that's a third-party claim. If that plaintiff who's injured and fractures her femur, has a dis she goes to her carrier, her own uh, auto carrier, uh, for three categories of, of losses, for, for wage loss, for three years, for medical, for lifetime related to that accident, and for what we call replacement services. Those three categories in Michigan with no fault, you go to your own carrier to get that. You're not going to the other driver, the other uh, alleged at fault entity. So the first party claim is when Mrs. Smith injures her femur, she submits all of her medicals, the, her own carrier pays those medicals for a year, but then says, you know what, we're done paying. Your femur fractures are healed, we're not going to pay for your knee was pre-existing. We're not going to pay for any more PT. We're not going to pay for any more occupational therapy. And she brings a suit on the first party side. The third party side is again, Mrs. Smith versus the trucking firm and, and the carrier. Typically what a plane stream will roll into along with a straight negligence claim against the driver uh, that's there and also an owner liability claim against the trucking firm is they'll bring in a negligent entrustment claim. And it's, it's viable, it, it's a whole separate claim in Michigan that we deal with. And it basically, as the definition indicates, you're, you're, uh, if you give permission or ownership to uh, drive a motor vehicle, in, in your case, a semi-tractor trailer, that entity, the, the carrier that entrusts that with a driver, if they entrust that vehicle with a driver that's either inexperienced uh, not skilled, not properly trained, et cetera, there's a separate claim, a separate cause of act, uh, action involving negligent entrustment. It basically deals with the owner uh, permitting an inexperienced or improper driver to be driving. Um, it, the traction with these cases comes into play, or that claim is, and it gets back to what Chris and I have been talking about, if you've got a driver with a poor record, you've got a driver with lack of training, you've got a driver with inexperience, that negligent entrustment claim is gonna get some, get some traction. And, and the, the, the plaintiff's trainers are gonna push that hard at, at a 
at a, a mediation or if it goes to trial, they're going to push it hard there. And it'd be a whole separate cause of action on the jury verdict form that they could recover. So what, what you want to do is, again, it gets back to documenting your drivers in terms of training, their hiring, their driving record, their skill set, all those things. So all that stuff is there. And then, frankly, as Chris alluded, making tough decisions. If, if, if drivers need to be off the road for some period of time for more training, if drivers need some additional uh, training with regard to particular types of turns, particular types of driving, or simply need to be let go, it, it's a far more wise decision to make those types of decisions than to have a paper trail that really is going to be fodder to the plaintiff's attorney with a negligent entrustment claim. Um, I, again, I see it pled quite often. Most times it's not pushed too hard uh, by plaintiff's attorneys unless they have all kinds of stuff, be it the inexperience, the lack of training, no safety training, whatever, that they can really push it. And, and you can think of it as this way. If you ever do get to trial, um, typically jurors don't want to really target and go after a driver. It's a single individual person, you know, Mr. Jones, Mr. Smith, Mrs. Wilson, whatever. But when it's the entity, the carrier, ABC freight line or whatever, they're more apt to push that because the, the sympathy factor is out the door and the deep pocket argument is made. So if a claim strength and the negligent trust that claim goes to the carrier, if they didn't properly uh, provide uh, to their driver um, that semi-tractor trailer, be it lack of training, lack of experience, et cetera, they maybe it should have been hired. They push that envelope, that's going to be difficult for the carrier. Uh, again, that's where the, the jury simply, there's not a whole lot of sympathy for that big, for that big carrier. They do for the driver. Um, but in terms of the negligent entrustment theory, the plane strain, it's really kind of a second bite of the apple at, at the motor carrier. And, and we, we deal with it all the time. Um, and it's something to be aware of. It's viable in Michigan. There's case law. The, the most recent case I pulled was not really particular to this situation, but it was a, it was a rental car company, Enterprise, that uh, a renter comes in, rents the vehicle, and then gives it to his daughter to drive the rental vehicle. And the, the, the father who rented the car tried to get out of the case, uh, brought a dispositive motion arguing, hey, I wasn't the true owner of the vehicle. Um, Enterprise was. Plaintiff's negligent entrustment case against me should be dismissed because I wasn't the owner. The Michigan Court of Appeals back in January of, of 18 said, you don't even have to be a, a, a technically the owner to have a viable negligent entrustment uh, case. You simply have to be the supplier of the motor vehicle, provide it to someone else, and they then do something wrong. They're negligent in their operation. If they were in, in lack of experience, uh, lack of training, not driving properly, have a bad driving record, and you knew of that, you had notice of that, that negligent entrustment case is going to prevail. It's going to go to a jury, even if you weren't the title owner, weren't the registrant, but you supplied it to, to them. I, I think in our case with, with more carriers, that issue is not really going to be in a play much. They're going to be the title owner, have ownership control of the semi-tractor trailer. So, again, it gets back to hiring well, training well, documenting very well so that, that any type of push by a plan in terms of negligent entrustment will, will be deflated, frankly, because if they get some, some good stuff there with respect to that, their focus then is going to be on the carrier, and that, that's going to be difficult. So that's, that, that theory, I don't know about other states, but Michigan, it's, it's a viable cause of action. It's not woven into a negligence claim, and it can be pled separately. Well, on that note, so one of the questions that came in that we'd like to maybe get both opinions on, uh, many motor carriers will hire a third-party safety consultant to take on a lot of that work. And, and when that happens, Chris and, and Tim, how often should that safety consultant have interaction with the, the management team, and how do they uh, use that safety consultant and still insulate themselves from that culture that we talk about, making sure that they're Having that culture from the top level, so you have third party. Yeah, that's a tricky one. I see that sometimes, and and I think there's pros and cons. The pros can be that it's the third party can be viewed as, hey, um, this is what the, the safety people say. The safety consultant says we got to do. We got to follow this. It's, it's kind of the way it is. You know, people use the insurance company the same way. The insurance company says we can't hire you because you know whatever. 
So it can be kind of like, um, you know, someone just sort of um, used to, to say this is the way it ought to be and, and you've got to follow what he or she says. Um, the downside is sometimes you, you don't get like real true buy-in when you have, you know, safety personnel that are, that are truly invested or that it's woven into the culture that it's, that, you know, you're kind of farming it out. So I see, I see, I don't see it a lot. Well, I see it, I see it a fair amount, but um, especially with maybe smaller mid-sized fleets, um, you know, I, I see pros and cons to it. And like anything, I think that it just, if, if you're the, the owner, you need to empower whoever it is that, that has oversight on, on safety to, to, all, to influence operations. And those don't need to be mutually exclusive. The safety and operations do not need to be mutually ex exclusive. So they can be uh, symbiotic and, and really um, work together to, 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 you know, allow you to be a profitable motor carrier. That's the truth. It really is. Um, and good question. I've seen that more in the context of, of construction. I, I do uh, some construction work as well. So I'll have construction managers or general contractors hire a safety consultant who a two or three year project will be involved in daily and monthly inspections and stuff and giving feedback. I've used that in cases I've had as a positive because my client's construction company is, is proactively getting involved a consultant. I'm trying to think out loud. I don't think I've seen it any of the motor cures I've defended over the years have had that. Um, I've seen them more, as Chris said, the in-house. I don't see it as a downside. I would argue if I'm defending that cure, hey, they're taking a proactive step, paying money, resource to have another set of eyes come in and give input and give direction to, to supplement their internal. Um, I, I do agree. I have. I, I can envision maybe the buy-in is not as strong um, that it could happen now. From a legal standpoint, it's the thing I always think about. Be careful of what communication takes place between that consultant and the carrier, uh, knowing that the claims train is going to know at some point in time through discovery that a consultant, ABC Consulting Company, has now been working with our safety department for the last five years. So communications there are likely going to be discoverable. Um, but I, I would, I, I don't think it's a negative. I think it's a positive. I would, you know, I, I would, if I'm defending so that my position to the jury is going to be or to me or is going to be, listen, they take it so seriously, they took and paid money for another set of eyes and ears to give them input and consultation. And whenever I have drivers that go to different seminars, through different carriers, through third parties, I'm always pushing that hard so that they're, when you went to training, how often it was, how many hours, how often you're doing it, the more training, the more uh, of that type of stuff that comes out from the driver, it, it comes off very, it's much better than someone. I, I haven't been trained off. I was hired five years ago, and basically they on the job training for about a day and a half, and they gave me the keys, and now you're rolling. That doesn't typically go over as well as someone's getting some type of frequent training update, be it by some other third party. I think, Tim, you had mentioned, too, and you've seen it where uh, the litigation attorney will use the argument, Mr. Driver, do you think that if motor carrier would have given you more training than the accident would have happened? Do you speak kind of how that can have an impact on the plan? Yeah, it gets a little bit to, to the reptile theory in terms of, again, trying the plan string, trying to make the jur, jury or the mediators try to resolve the matter, you know, the ultimate, you know, safety person. And, and it just, um, you, you got to sit down with, your client, the driver, in depth prep, well in advance of the deposition, get hypotheticals and not go down the primrose path and be able to say, no, that, that's not the case. I've been to three different training things. I've attended all of them. Here's the sign-in sheet. Here's the areas we covered. And, and, and I attended those things. Um, but, you know, they're going to try to plant the seed that more could have been done and there's additional steps that could have been taken to avoid to make this motoring out there completely 100% safe. And, no, it, it's, it's inherently dangerous to be hauling uh, on an expressway at 65 miles per hour a semi-tractor trailer with a 53-foot trailer. But there are accidents or things that you just simply can't control. The weather, the speed of other vehicles, the, the road condition, et cetera. So, um, but that, that's, that will, that leading questions like that will take place with skilled plaintiff's attorneys to, to try to basically turn the tables uh, with respect to the driver. And that's where the depth prep going through hypothetical questions, be prepared for this and 
stay firm. You got to stay firm. Um, we can object during deposition. Typically, in Michigan, the really only thing we can do is object a form or foundation of a question. We can't coach. We technically can't give leading uh, objections. Um, but hopefully, if you prepared your client, the driver well, they know from the objections you're making um, some input in terms of where to, where to apply the brakes with the with the with the questioning. So documentation is key. And starting today, if you if you haven't begun doing these things, start today work kind of plan because you know showing a good faith that once you learn that there's a benefit to doing these things and doing them moving forward is going to help in that difference as well. When I get a well put together personnel file and driver qualification file for a driver, when I get a new case, it's it's huge. It, it, I tell right away this company's got it together, organized, and it, it's not. It, it's all well put together. A separate personnel file, a separate driver qualification file. It has the application, has the due diligence they did before with hiring them pursuant to federal regs. It has all the accidents documented. And really presents well. All of it's discoverable to have all that documentation versus little or none. It, it, your client just presents that much better. Yeah, on that note, I would say that a good safety manager is worth her or his weight in gold. They really are. You, you can't view that, that function as, you know, um, an afterthought or, or give it lip service. You know, and that's, that's, that's the danger, I think, of hiring out to a third party is it's like, okay, we're checking the box and we're Kind of giving it a little bit of lip service, good safety person is really going to inspire your drivers to to do the job well and want to follow the rules, and is going to um, not just be you know the cop and and you know um, using the stick instead of the carrot. I mean that that drop that safety person is going to help your drivers understand that hey you have a tough job but you are you are a professional driver. And this is a big deal, and this is why we do what we do, and this is how it, how what you do affects the company, you know, and affects your 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 fellow drivers and your your uh, fellow employees. You know, we want you to get home safely to your family. We care about you. This is why we want you to do these things. And and you know, so a good safety manager is going to, um, you know, be able to discipline and coach the right way, but also inspire and, and help people see why it is they want them to follow the rules, you know. There's, too, a lot of public information that's available about motor carriers today, right? We talked about the DOT, FMCSA, websites, all that information is public. Can we both you get a little bit of perspective on, like, the CAP reports and how that impacts decision-making from a defense perspective and from an insurance perspective? So I, I made the analogy of the big wood-paneled office that the plaintiff's attorney firm is sitting in on Monday morning saying, which of these files here are we going to go after? And the one they're going to go after is the one that's got the CSA score that's in alert. That's the one they go, oh, you know, we got this one. Mm. You know, this one, the, the facts aren't great, like, you know, but everything looks good. That looks like a clean carrier. This one, boom, we're going to make something out of this one. And so as an insurance carrier, you have to take – the data with a little bit of a grain of salt, because I understand how CSA scores can be gained, and I get that, that there's part, you know, that it's not perfect, okay? So we understand that, and we, we're not just going to dismiss somebody because they might have a higher unsafe driving or whatever. I mean, we're, we might, you know, we're, we, all, we take that's that all into consider, consideration, but um, it's, we, we do notice that, and you do need to be aware that if you have alerts, um, you're now on the radar. It's out there. It's known yeah. that the plant attorney, they search it. The other thing that I think people know is the social media is searched big time. I mean, oh. that's one of the first thing I do. Huge. And it's typically more advantageous for us doing defense work to get the social media of the plaintiff and their family. But I, I, there's no doubt in my mind the drivers out there, you know, they're being named in the suit with their motor carrier. Their social media is going to be searched, and it's going to be searched between Facebook, Instagram, you name it, Snapchat. It's all looked into, and um, it, it, it basically, my my advice, and I know plant trees will say they're fine, but shut it down. Once, once it happens, shut it down with respect to that incident because it becomes huge, huge fodder for attorneys. Um, when you're taking their deposition two years after the accident, they're posting, I'm, I'm taking the deposition of plaintiff who's claiming A, B, C, D with the injuries, with regard to wage loss, with regard to restrictions, with regard to all kinds of stuff. 
and you've got Facebook posts all over the, the, the country traveling, taking trips, amusement parks, different things. The same thing is reversed. The plane insurance are looking for the social media um, with respect to the companies and the drivers and looking to use that um, in the litigation process. And it's out there. And, and everyone needs to be aware of that because it's being looked at. Well, thank you, Chris. Thank you, Tim, for taking some time out of your schedule to visit with the, the team here at Oliver and Deck and all those that have tied in. And we had a great turnout, so we appreciate you taking some time from your day to do that. You know, no, no doubt as you think about some of the things we talked about today, uh, there's certainly some things maybe feel overwhelming. There's a lot of pressure coming in against any sort of fleet or motor carrier, and sometimes you feel like just giving up, and, and that's certainly not what we're wanting to do. Uh, we really want to instill in you the confidence to know what the enemy's throwing at you so that you can respond to that and pivot and be a successful motor carrier. Uh, as you think about some of the things, I mean, you took some notes today, and you would like some help with kind of taking those steps to align your organization and insulate it as best as possible from the, the negative things that are going on out there, uh, please feel free to reach out to the team at Oliver and Dyke. Uh, we spend a lot of time helping our clients and, and prospective clients as well uh, to identify opportunities where they can insulate themselves, or create a plan, and then uh, execute that plan so that you too can become one of those carriers that has a competitive advantage in the marketplace. So again, on behalf of the team at Oliver and Dyke, thank you for tying in and we hope to see you in person at our 2021 transportation.